channel is uh, English on? Pensé yo no sabía, pero... ¡Ey! Diego, Diego, ¿qué pasa de Luis? De mi bat Luis Diego. Luis Diego, de mi bat.
Hello, good afternoon. Welcome back. Please take your seat so we can start with the kickoff of the hackathon. To our hackathon kickoff moderator, Robert Shaw, head of the ITU Development Sectors Innovation Division, who will moderate the next panel. Please uh, finish up taking your seats and get ready. Hope you enjoy, thanks. Okay, we'll get started in just a few minutes as soon as we get our speakers up here. I hope you all had a nice lunch. Okay, we're about ready to get started. We're a little bit late. I think you had a very nice lunch. You're all quite animated and going. And um, the title of this session is the, the official, may we take our seats, find a seat. It's good to see so many enthusiastic people back from lunch. This is sort of a kickoff of the hackathon, and I guess most of you probably know what hackathon because you're all about half my age or younger. So, um, anyway, I think um, so. The lucky guy. Anyway, so we're launching this hackathon, and we're going to have uh, the theme of this is hack the Millennium Development Goals or hack the MDGs. Young smart programmers to to try and develop applications in 24 hours. They're not allowed to sleep, I guess, or uh, and, uh, eat pizzas in front of their computers and so on. And I'm told that actually we were. Uh, it's not clear, perhaps, to somebody, to some of you, but uh, we're welcoming with open arms more developers who want to be involved in this hack the MDGs hackathon. So, uh, do we have Luis Diego here? Uh, not yet. I thought he might like to say a few words about encouraging people to uh, uh, participate. Um, anyway, so this is, as I said, a 24-hour competition. I think we're hoping for around 80 developers or so. And um, I'm told that I should highlight a, a few of the things. Uh, this is being interpreted into the six official UN languages. And uh, this session is also being captioned uh, uh, so that the deaf community can follow it. And of course, we, you know, this is supposed to be a, a conversation, a dialogue. So we very much encourage all of you sitting in front of your mobiles and iPads and Macs and PCs and so on to, to be part of the conversation and uh, use hashtag uh, Beyond 2015 to give your inputs and be part of the, the dialogue. That's on Google Plus and Facebook and, and uh, oh great, okay, we do have them here. So um, Luis Diego, I won't even try and pronounce your last name, I'm sorry. Um, I invite you to come up and say a few words about that. Thank you very much. Um, I was asked just to uh, make an announcement. We're um, pretty much closing the registration for the hackathon. And uh, we're looking forward to bring more developers or, or participants that want to join us and acquire this challenge of 24 hours developing, working on uh, generate solutions on three main topics, education, sustainability, environment, and uh, health. So we just had a, a great ideation meeting with, with so many experts that will also uh, joining us during, this, uh, during the, the whole competition to help you out with, with ideas and testing, testing your uh, prototypes, prototypes and everything. Uh, also many, many, many people from uh, different countries and different backgrounds are, are um, getting together to, to work on these projects. So this is the last call. If you want to join us, uh, we'll be in the, um, in the, the room in the next, next year. Um, it, was, it was funny because we asked uh, to the group who was, um, who was uh, participating in a hackathon before, and a few of them had, a, had an experience in the hackathons. But who in here has experience working on a social hackathon, which is developing solutions to social issues in 24 hours, non-stop, non-sleep, a lot of 
Coca-Cola, a lot of Red Bull, and a lot of coffee. It's also a guarantee of a lot of fun. We're going to have so much fun uh, during this um, 24 hours. So yeah, basically this is the last call. If you want to join us, developers or people from different backgrounds, uh, the registration is still open. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And just to sweeten the offer a little bit. Thank you. And just to sweeten the offer, uh, we have some very good sponsors here, and they've given us some nice prizes. I've been told I'm not allowed to mention specifically, but they are nice prizes, believe me. Uh, so if you participate, and we'll come up with, a, I guess, a, a series of winners in the, the different categories. Anyway, to get, uh, we have a, just about 30 minutes, and just to uh, provide a bit of inspiration for the hackathoners, or whatever the, the word is, um, we have some speakers here who are going to give their comments on the, on the importance of uh, applications and applications for social development, social entrepreneurship, and so on. We have from my uh, left here, Howard Charney, uh, Senior Vice President of Cisco. You saw him this morning. We have Kat Wang, uh, Senior Policy Analyst at Google. Uh, we have um, Akhtar, oh, sorry, um, Akhtar Bashad from Microsoft. I hope I didn't massacre that. And uh, then we have Victor from Claro, uh, who's the chief of uh, regulatory and wholesale services at Claro Costa Rica. And, uh, and then we have uh, Minister Alejandro Cruz Molino, Melina, who's the Minister of Science, Technology, and Telecommunications in Costa Rica. Welcome to you all. Okay, so perhaps what I'm going to do is uh, pitch a few questions to our, our panelists here and, and uh, let them give, us, give their views. Uh, I'll start here with Howard. Um, you represent, of course, one of the major vendors of the ICT in industry, it is Cisco. And, uh, and we all know that youth employment is a, is a very hot topic, youth entrepreneurship, uh, very important topic here at the, at the summit. When you are hiring individuals, what sort of skills are you are you looking for? Is it purely technical skills, or do you, you look at other things like creativity and so on? Uh, and and how do you actually support these skills for, let's say, social good or social entrepreneurship? So, when we hire people in general, we're looking for people who do have a certain set of skills. It's too difficult to take somebody and to teach them basic science or basic programming or basic physics or basic engineering. It's just not our job. We presume that you come to us with those skills. And so the, 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 the recruitment process involves the ascertainment of the quality of those skills. Now, let's not confuse what's going on here. Cisco is a for-profit organization. And the goal is not, not directly social beneficence. However, we do realize that the products that we sell are used globally in many different ways. They're used in providing water to citizens, and they're used to provide electricity, and they're used to provide uh, backbone communication services. And so what ends up happening is a blurring of the distinction between profits and the delivery of something which has value to the human race. And so even though the company in and of itself is not, is not, shall we say, a social benefit organization, such as the UN, it, it's, it's, it's ethos, and I'm always surprised when I talk to employees and I ask them, well, what, what, what's, what, what drives you? And they say, well, we'd like to change the world and make it a better place. And I think, well, that's kind of interesting because, you know, what's, what's really going on here is we're here to make profits. But they say, no, that's not exactly what we're really here for. And you know what? I've decided after all these years, they're right. So, good luck on your hackathon. I hope somebody wins. I hope a team wins, incidentally. There is no one person who is smarter than a group of people. So if one of you thinks you're smart enough to do this alone, you're wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Howard. <laughs> Fantastic, great. Okay, um, Kat, Kat from uh, Cisco. Um, but, oh, sorry, not from Cisco, Google. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you would have. She's looking for a job. Right? <laughs> Probably after this. Uh, okay, so uh, of course we all know the Google culture, the famous.
same as 20% of your time you can dedicate to, to working on perhaps individual projects. And I understand there's been a lot of interesting Google apps that have come out of that. Cat, uh, perhaps uh, you can talk to us about what are sort of the principles that, that Google tries to, to foster in its employees. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, that's a great question. So Google, as you know, and also YouTube as well, we grew out of a garage. Uh, so the startup culture is still very much well and uh, thriving at this company. And so I started at Google about six years ago. So I'm, I'm kind of a dinosaur now in, in Google years, I would say. Um, and the first experience that I had was at TGIF, uh, which is a great time where the entire Google community comes and sits down and listens to the, the news at Google from the founders themselves. And all the Nooglers are there. That's what we call kind of the new Googlers, uh, sitting in funny hats and kind of going all excited. And what really struck striked me as super interesting was at the really end when anybody could get on stage and ask a question um, and could pitch an idea to the founders in front of all of their peers. And that is something that I find so important at Google is this ability to speak out. It doesn't matter how small your idea or how big your moonshot idea is, you could just talk to your peers about it, work as a team, collaborate, and get it out there. Um, and it's something that Google really puts a lot of attention on is this employee empowerment. Um, not only in our 20% applications, which actually Gmail and Moderator came out of, um, it also wants to continue the educational cycle. So Googlers, um, both from kind of the, the, the coders and the engineers to kind of the social scientists like myself, we could go on rotations. We could go experience what it's like to work in Hong Kong or to work in Singapore or in South Africa, just to experience what the what the life is like there. And learning about kind of how your peers go about these projects day to day, um, you can come up with new ideas. And I think that is just, it's so important kind of who we are as humans, is to continue traveling and learning and experiencing things that you might never have thought of. Um, and the third thing that I would say is being silly, being whimsical. That's something that Google really loves. It's, it's this feeling of kind of anything could happen. It could be while you're playing ping pong, right? It could be when you're in a micro kitchen and you guys are just talking about kind of the new latest game, like Ingress or something. Um, you never know when it's gonna, gonna come. That strikes the brilliance. And so we really wanna focus at Google on creating the community and the environment where you're free to think and free to talk and all your peers can basically vote on your idea. Um, and so that's kind of something that I've always realized is very important to us. And additionally, I would say volunteering. Um, part of what I love about Google on the entrepreneurship side is that we place a lot of investment, a lot of time on getting others out there and getting others the tools that they need. Um, like developer APIs, for example. And we have an entire group dedicated within Google for called uh, Google for Entrepreneurs. And so I would, I would totally tell you guys to go and check out the site. There's a lot of great programs that we have. It's over 110 countries. We have over 100 programs now. So getting connected with your peers from all parts of the world, we definitely encourage that. Um, so yeah, I would say just have a lot of fun. Like this is so exciting and if I could code, I would come down there and join you. Uh, maybe you guys can teach me a thing or two. Okay, Akhtar, are you ready to tackle the, the same question? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, like my two colleagues from the from Cisco and Google have said, it is actually quite important that if you are thinking about a skill, that it is a core skill that you develop. Without a score, core skill, it is actually hard to work for any tech company. And we at Microsoft started we wouldn't call it a hackathon, but actually a competition 10 years ago called the Imagine Cup, which was focused on creating social solutions to the Millennium Development Goals. This was started in 2003, and 
the focus was to get university students to come together as teams and use technology to solve pressing social solutions. Last year, we had over 300,000 students from 208 countries participate, and we had 100 teams in the finals in St. Petersburg, Russia, that competed for various awards and prizes. But we've also looked at it and said there is one thing to actually create a competition, which is a student competition, and you know, get ideas out there. But how do we continue to support them? What can we do to take these ideas forward? And three years ago, we launched a competition on top of that competition called the Imagine Cup Grants, which is run by my team, where we take the winners and then ask them if they want to, the, the finalists, and if they want to apply back, if they want to take their ideas and turn it into a venture. Whether it is a social venture or a for-profit venture doesn't really matter. If they want to turn it into a venture, they apply again, and we work with a prestigious group of judges from different parts of the community. And then we invested about you know, $3 million into these organizations that we provide them with cash, technology, and mentorship support so that they can continue to take what they are doing to the next level. So this is one way in which we as a community of you know, technology professionals have stepped out and brought in our ecosystem to go around the world to encourage all of you to participate in an environment and an activity that can bring about sustainable change. But then it Microsoft itself for our employees, you know, look, if you're a creative individual, you're not going to take no for an answer, which is what I told you in the morning, and that's the same at Microsoft. Right, somebody comes up with an idea and they'll keep pushing it. Some of them turn into products that actually make us a lot of money. Some of them turn into products that do not make us a lot of money. But at the end of the day, people are actually trying. And one of the things that we do is that we have a garage which allows people to come and tinker, give their time, come up with solutions. And then from a social perspective, we actually get our employees to go out and volunteer. We will you know, pay their time to the nonprofit organization where they volunteer at $17 an hour, so you can hire employees go out and volunteer to a nonprofit organization, and then we write a check to that nonprofit organization, and people do all sorts of things. You just go painting a fence, reading a book to a child in a, in a hospital, or to going and solving you know, IT solutions for nonprofit organizations, IT problems. So there is just a way in which we can give back, and I think the message that I want you to have here is that the hackathon is one way of really unleashing your creativity and unleashing your creativity in a team where you can work with different people, hear dis different perspectives, agree on a problem that you want to address, and then come up with a solution and present it. And that's the most important thing that you can do is to get out there and try. Thanks. Okay. Oh, well, uh, thank you very much, and it, it's great to hear emphasis again of the, of the thing about a team. I mean, we often have this idea of the lone genius, the lone inventors, but most good ideas come around the conference table when you get people together and they bounce ideas off of you. Okay, next we have Victor from Claro, from uh, Costa Rica, and uh, uh, perhaps you, I know that uh, you've got some, you have some fellowship programs for developers uh, here in Costa Rica, and can you tell us a little bit more about that program and uh, what are what some of the advice that you would give to our hackathoners, let's say? Well, thank you very much to all of you. Claro really is a very young company. It's a subsidiary of a conglomerate of companies known as uh, America Mobile. It's a young company, anyhow, and we're very focused on innovation. We have provided important contributions to very many mobile accesses across Latin America, and we're providing a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, app development. And uh, this company has always been focused business-wise in order to roll out infrastructure, having ITC's infrastructure. Now, uh, the time has come where the tide is turning. Now we are looking more into app development. And that's precisely part of the programs that we have mentioned. 
more than simply a program of scholarships. It's indeed a platform from which you can have access to so many operations that we have across Latin America and uh, access to over 300 million people in order to make available those applications that we're going to be developing. Uh, it is truly a platform that will support young entrepreneurs that sometimes will not have the resources in order to have their own platform. Um, we are also providing them with uh, training courses, especially when it comes to um, life cycle for the product from the conception all the way to implementation and construction of the product. So to all of the different 18 different places where we do have a presence in Latin America. It is important to see how our telecommunication company has evolved into uh, something, into a company that uh, is rather developing applications now. I would suggest that there are three answers as of why this is like that. The first one, I would venture to say is that the uh, technological and communication companies, we have come to realize that telecommunications and the technologies are not, um, it, it's actually a means to an end, it's not an end unto itself. And we are looking forward to achieving all of the benefits that we can attain by using these applications, these technologies, in order to improve our everyday lives and change people's lives. So we have come to realize that, and we have come a full circle, and uh, we had to face uh, network convergences, services convergences, uh, industry convergence, and at this moment, we are a challenge uh, point of convergence where we cannot do things by ourselves. We need multidisciplinary teams that will participate and that we have knowledge in different areas. And that will definitely put us uh, in the second answer, why we are turning into, or why we are turning our face into this new part of this industry, beyond just access. All of this migration that's going on, we cannot do this by ourselves. We need everybody's talent. The challenges before us are given to us by society for its social, cultural, economical um, development actually do require everybody's participation. Not only developers, not only programmers, but also all of those that are part of the cultural and academic activities and that that could be the uh, origin point for all of the different ideas that we need to develop when we come to talk to all of these applications and transform everybody's lives in a very positive way. The third cause or the third reason why we are making this turn towards uh, a company that has uh, a focus on applications is that we have realized the uh, added value of content. We said this in the past, and I think this morning we discussed that as well. It's not only a matter of having access to the content, but actually being able to use it and know how to use it and how to make it available to everybody, how to share them in these platforms. These contents have a very important a value when we talk about e economic values. We're talking about for 2017, a half of the income from telecommunication companies are precisely going to come from apps and all of these added value services, including, of course, internet access. And uh, the most important part of this uh, line of thought is just we are companies, as just the gentleman from Cisco says, we are not only for profit. Indeed we are. But we have a vested interest in uh, making everybody compatible with these platforms that we are creating. The uh, economic interest of generating revenue, of course, goes hand in hand with the social impact of the activities we are developing in the different areas of society. That is the one reason I think 
that would be the most important as of why we are focusing on app development on all of the added value services uh, clearly there is no incompatibility between entrepreneurship and uh, desire for profit and of course the social impact of all the activities that we can develop in that sense this program that was mentioned at the very beginning it's a platform that uh, it's a platform that uh, provides all the youth with the life cycle of a product from end to end uh, even to those that do not have the money to pay for it uh, or that uh, traditionally that have not been able to pay for it we uh, wish you all a new most successful venture with hackathon in 24 hours, we are looking forward to seeing all of the results that you're going to have uh, through this uh, very interesting contest. Thank you very much on behalf of Claro. We welcome you to this beautiful country, Costa Rica. Todo el mundo está tratando de infraestructura hasta arriba. Todo el mundo sabe para valor. Thank you for, for joining us, of course. Uh, Mr. Alejandro Cruz Molina, um, you're all alone because these are all private sector companies here, and uh, and of course, uh, one of the questions for many governments or governments here, of course, uh, what are the sort of policies that you can put into place to really foster growth in this this sector uh, on both the supply and the demand side? You know, so you, you know, what are the policies to help people become entrepreneurs and develop applications, but also what are sort of the applications that can be developed on the public sector side? To, to sort of create the demand. Good afternoon. I wanted to um, welcome everyone here to Costa Rica. And I wish that you have a great time here. And I want to congratulate all of the hackers here today already who are starting right now this hackathon. S certainly. Of the panelists that represent the public sector and public policy in the field of science, of technology, and telecommunications. I would like to focus on telling you that our public policy aims towards three main areas that are extremely practical to promote the uh, advancement of human resources as a resources and also as the final goal of development for a country that wants to continue to grow of an economy based on the efficiency of its resources and of its production to move towards an economy of innovation and towards a, an information and knowledge society you the youth represent the best we have on our planet and you are the main resource of the development of all of our countries. I congratula congratulate you all for being here today, and I also wish to congratulate all of those who've already registered to participate in this hackathon, because what distinguishes a, a hacker, and also from another young person who is committed and focused on knowledge, whether that be scientific or technological. It's his creativity, his ability to do teamwork, his ability to set goals that in some cases may seem focused solely on the financial. It's still, in the end, just a means to overcome challenges, to use the technology, and to understand what's behind of the applications that we use every day. And certainly, it will have the ultimate goal of a social and human impact. And this is why our public policy needs to be, first of all, it needs to be our first priority focused on the youth and the talent of our human resources in our country. This is what will allow us to grow. This is what will allow us to become more competitive. And above all else, this will allow us to have a, a better quality of life for all of our citizens. 
Secondly, as a result of this policy, our my ministry has been promoting innovation and productivity, especially in small to mid-sized businesses. And I know that all of you here, you're almost part of it already. You are one part of it as entrepreneurs, as creative talent, as people who are committed in your communities and in your countries. And without a doubt, there's a financial interest, which is important. As I mentioned, at the end of the day, there's also a social and human impact on our, of our development. And the third element of our public policy, which is last but not least important, this year, starting February, the Vice Ministry of Telecommunications was joined to our ministry. And as Victor, who is representing one of the main companies who are present in our region and our market and our country, telecommunications and information technologies and communication technologies, what they represent is, number one, they are a tool for our development, for our empowerment, but they are also possibilities and opportunities to develop content and to develop aspects that will improve our daily lives. So, in this context, everything is focused on the human being. So, I congratulate you for being here today. Our goal, as representatives of the government, is to promote these policies through mechanisms and tools that will allow to truly structure and give life to all of your good intentions, all of your ideas and objectives. And of course, some of these things may include competitions at the national and international level, also to promote people and uh, have them study technology, improve education at all levels. Have we as said, we need to remaining in the educational system and we want you to take advantage of all the opportunities that are available to you through our education system. But additionally, we also need to create the proper mechanisms to allow the youth of today, which are the adults of tomorrow, the entrepreneurs of tomorrow, the businessmen of tomorrow, to have the financial resources to make their dreams come true. Today, we were discussing in our generational dialogue that we all have dreams. And because we all have dreams, the role of the government is to help make those dreams come true. Through um, investment, also venture capital, also seed capital, to support entrepreneurs. We need to support companies that are just starting. And why not word it this way? We also need to consolidate the presence of multinational companies in our country because they are creating sources of employment which are an added value. So, in summary, all of this contributes to the social welfare and of our countries and also the benefit of our human lives. Costa Rica is a small country. It's not very large. We're just four million inhabitants. And our main resources is our people. So, if I have to summarize Costa Rica into three words, which need to be truly supported by the government of the Republic, is we need to support human talent, we need to promote innovation, and also technological development as a source for human wellness. Thank you. Get me, but I, you allow us at least take a couple yeah, questions. I hope uh, from the people here. So, is uh, can we a couple of good questions for the, the panel here? It's hard to see from up here. No questions? Oh, sorry. Oh, waving in the back there. Yes. Is there a mic? Yes. Thank you very much uh, for allowing me to participate. I think that it's excellent the idea. 
if every child had a computer, we'd have the happiest children in the world. But I wanted to ask questions to the people of Cisco and Microsoft, or whatever company that you're representing, whether it's technology or telecommunications. Right now, there are a lot of campaigns for paper, plastic, glass, etc. And this would have been the greatest um, support in the 18th century, because right now we have technological waste. We have batteries and all sorts of types of dangerous chemicals which are hazardous for the environment. I wanted to ask you, what do you do when the cell phone batteries, or whether it's AAA or AA batteries, or any other electronic device gets damaged? How do you dispose of this waste? What do you do to dispose of this waste? Because regrettably, all electronic devices have batteries and lots of chemicals that uh, will have a life of thousands of years. So I would like a uh, few of the people who are on the stage to answer, please. We don't have much time, so I, just I mean, I can yeah. but first, first of all, it is a question for the equipment manufacturer. We may eventually become one, but till that time, I but, but I, I will say that it's a very important issue. And in the US, for example, I mean, there is now a law which allows you to recycle all of your materials. This is actually paid by the manufacturers, and it is collected safely and disposed of safely. Microsoft, for, from our side, we actually have Microsoft approved refurbishers all over the world in all parts of the world where used machines are dis given to them, where they are refurbished and then sent back into educational and NGO organizations where we provide our software back on it at a very low discount so that the life of the computer can be extended for a reasonable period of time. So there are a number of things that organizations are doing to ensure that we mitigate the issue that you are talking about. So we do manufacture equipment and lots of it. And so over the years, we've done a number of things to make the equipment more green with respect to the environment. And so the equipment of today versus the equipment of a few years ago consumes much less power, much less. We, we've stopped using certain chemicals and we've stopped using certain types of, um, well, for example, lead and solder. We don't use lead anymore because it's too polluting of the environment. And there are programs by which customers turn in equipment to us and we properly dispose of it. The key here is not whether the equipment has to be disposed of, because it always has to be disposed of at some point. The question is, how do you do it responsibly? And so we have, we've attempted to put in place programs whereby equipment does get cycled and does get disposed of in a manner which is consistent with our environmental sensitivities. Now, it, what, it, what is true is that, is that there are batteries, and you're right. There are batteries in cell phones, and there are batteries in backup batteries, and even fancy routers. And so we have to dispose of these things properly. And as a, as a manufacturer, we take this extremely seriously because we want to be the very best citizen of our, on our planet with respect to holding the planet's assets in the highest regard. So you're, you're not incorrect, but over time we've now learned that television sets and we've learned that VCRs and we've learned that CD players and batteries have a dark side. And the dark side is to be respectful of the fact that they will pollute our environment if we don't take care of, take care of them properly. Okay, thank you much. I'm getting stared at here, <laughs> and we need to, to wrap our session up. Um, anyway, I think one of the messages that came across here during this panel session was, uh, you know, just get out there and do it. The tools are out there. Don't be afraid. And, uh, and it reminds me of a great quote from uh, Reid Hoffman, who's the founder of LinkedIn. And he said, I, I, I have this up in my office at times, if you aren't embarrassed by the first version you shipped, you shipped too late. And <laughs> So, you know, just get out there, prototype it, s you know, get the feedback from the team, and do it again, okay? So anyway, I'd like to, to thank all our panelists. I'm sure you have more questions for them, but they'll be walking out that way probably, and so you can just grab them as they go out. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all the panelists again. We have a 15 minute uh, presentation uh, of the Beyond 2015 Be Healthy, Be Mobile competition. Uh, so I would like to ask please, Vera Kern, Celedonio Von <laughs> and Juan Carlos Blanco Infante. I'm gonna get that name correct. Please do the stage, thanks. Von Wutenau. Von Yes, thank you very much. <laughs> and sorry. Well, first off, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, we're very excited to hear about the competition. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask Vera, what is the competition about? If you can tell us, please. Hi, I'm Vera. I'm from a startup in New York, and we are called Noom, and we're trying to help people lead better lives. And uh, one thing that basically everybody in this world can do to be healthier is to walk, and to walk more, and then to walk even more. Um, I personally walk a lot. I walk to work, I walk from work, I walk to meet my friends, I walk to do groceries. I basically walk everywhere. Um, and once you get used to it, it's actually pretty cool and you don't have to take the ugly subway in New York. Um, so luckily I work at, an, at an, a startup that is concerned with health issues and one thing that we found was that with the smartphones and all the fancy sensors they have, we can actually build an app, a step counting app on your smartphone because most people carry their phone everywhere they go anyways. So why carry an extra device if you can just have it on your phone and use all the calculating power the phone has. So we built this app, it's called Noom Walk. N-O-O-M and then walk. You can download it on the Android market, it's free, and you can register for it. And every day it will count your steps from when you get up to when you go to bed. And you can see your steps overall, you can see your records, which is kind of motivating to a lot of people, and you can also see your friend's step and other people's steps. So you can get a sense of how much other people walk and maybe increase your personal walk time per day. Um, for this Summit, we created a competition to for you guys to for, and we created a dashboard so we can see every day who in the takes the most steps every day, who walks around some city we're in. And um, so you can, I don't know, I think there was, I was told there would be, yes, shown here, no one's in there yet because they're just distributing the registrations. So once people register on this list, you will see your name, and if you upload a little picture, you will see your picture, and it will show your steps for today, and starting tomorrow, it will also accumulate your steps over the three days. And then on Wednesday, we'll find out who walked the most steps over these three days, and the first 10 people will win some prizes. Okay, thank you very much. That sounds exciting, and we should definitely start using it, at least in Costa Rica. We don't walk much. <laughs> um, no. Uh, well, to the Alcatel representatives, Celedonio and Juan Carlos. Can you please tell us why is Alcatel supporting this competition? Okay, lo voy a decir en... I will say this in Spanish. The, your challenge will be to walk as you develop your applications. So you have 24 hours to walk and accumulate all your points. Alcatel is a company that provides networks. We do research development. We sell and implement the networks. The networks that you use for communication, to do your phone calls, to access the internet, to access your mobiles, the landlines, cable TV, uh, all types of networks. Now, the concrete reality is that the networks are part of this world that we're living in. And this broadband world that we live in is essential for the development of each one of our countries. The social development of our countries, and also the personal development of each one of you. Also, what we need to do worldwide is to create a worldwide broadband network because the benefit for society at large is undoubtable. But there's another great challenge. I may have a great network, but if I have no applications, if I have no content, it's useless. If I don't have people 
who are accessing it through devices that they can use this network, it's useless. And this is a great challenge in our industry. And for a company like ours, where we focus mostly on infrastructure, we're also concerned about the content issue, and especially issues related to education and health. Education, because without educated people, you can't make take a benefit of a broadband world network. You can't take benefit of all that the internet has to offer. And that's why you need to educate the average citizen, you need to educate the kids, you need to educate the teachers, professors, and each one of us here, even the ones who already are older than 25. And along with education, hand in hand with it, we have health. Why? Broadband becomes a real tool to allow you to provide wellness to your party or ourselves. And health apps that may help you to keep people healthy, to also prevent diseases, and also to accompany people throughout the all of the illness process is essential. And that's what Alcatel is doing worldwide. And that is why we are supporting in this STEPS application. I just find out that there's a minimal amount of steps that we need to take on a daily basis. And I think we're quite s uh, sedentary. So a lot of them, especially the ones who work in offices. And this can help us to become aware that these steps that can help us with our health. Well, Juan Carlos, uh, he wants to say something easier here in Costa Rica. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just briefly, I also represent Alcatel uh, Educate. This is actually a branch of research that is very strong through Bell Laboratories, as many of you might know. We develop technology. We understand that uh, it's very well used in the day-to-day -day communication today. The youth, adults, also are submerged in communication and only in technology. And over here, we decided to support health because we are keen, we're invested on keep, uh, keeping people connected and that actually leverage technology so that it can have a good use of that it's not only zombie users just connected in the network just leeching from other bandwidth but actually to make something out of it and to actually make the best out of the device that they can also have good health and a good a healthy lifestyle We've been all given uh, the registration forms so if you want to register for this competition I think we should all do it. Um, fill it in, please. And when you're leaving the, the, pl the plenary, there's going to be someone next to the photo booth uh, collecting the, the forms, because that's the way you're going to be registered officially. So thank you very much. And thank you for supporting also this excellent idea. And I hope it has lots of success here and everywhere. <laughs> Thanks. To walk. Okay, now we'll be back uh, to in the plenary at 5 p.m., but before, please stay sit. We're just going to go through the different workshops that are going to be held for the next two hours. I'm going to repeat them, and probably I'm going to have some support of a slide. If not, I'm just going to say them. Uh, we have the part two of Build My Digital Enterprise at Room Chiripo, uh, Negotiate for Success at Room Corcovado number two, be a volunteer, the second part, Corcovado three, realize your creative independence online at Cahuita number one, and strengthening your entrepreneurial skills, Cahuita number two. And uh, for the ones who registered for the hackathon, we're really happy because the number went up and it's going to be an amazing competition. As of now, uh, the, um, the hackathon is starting at Room Gondola. If you have any doubts, look for Luis Diego. He's going to be there trying to help you out. Thank you very much. Enjoy the next couple of hours, and see you at 5 p.m.
Hey everybody, <laughs> we're going to be talking some more about digital enterprises and building them in a bit. If you're not here for that, you're probably making a bad decision, so I encourage you to stay. Anyway, don't go to the other workshops, <laughs> although I'm sure they're wonderful. But anyway, if you're here and you want to talk about this, pile in uh, this way. Let's fill these front tables, because it turns into chaos if we're scattered all over the room. Yeah, woo! <laughs> No, I, I like making games. Uh, that's what my background is in, but uh, the card game is the first I've made in a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Cool. Uh, I'm just going to start talking because it's more fun that way. And then people can come in and out. And in a couple minutes, I'll stop talking. And then we can get it back to figuring out how to build your businesses. Uh, so it's quite difficult to build something big. If we want to start something from scratch, just invent it out of thin air, it's tough, right? There's a million different directions it could go in. We have 100,000 ideas to choose from. Uh, it's not just, it's not as easy, like, so opening a restaurant is difficult. If you want to open a restaurant, right, you need to decide which food to serve and how much to charge. And then there's all the challenges about, like, how do I actually do it? How do I make sure it's clean and in order and my staff is happy, and the customers are pleased, everything comes out quickly? All this stuff's difficult. But you basically know what you're trying to do, right? People, <laughs> people come in, they decide what they want to eat, you cook it for them, and they, they pay you. You kind of know how the business works. If we're doing something on the internet, or we're creating something from scratch, it's totally different. We have no idea how any of it works, right? 
People might come to your website and it's free, but you sell data. Or they might come and they might pay you. Or they might come and it's free, but then they optionally buy extra stuff. Or someone else could be sponsoring it. There, there's so many different ways that you could arrange it that you just don't know what you're trying to do from the beginning. Uh, and when that's the case, we, we really need to have a way to figure out what people care about. Uh, and one of the ones that you guys mentioned earlier uh, is that we can talk to people. We can say like, hey, what do you care about? What do you need in your life? What sucks about your day? Uh, and if we can find a way to make their life much better, uh, then maybe we can build a business around that or you know, a nonprofit or a movement. We can do something, right? Um, <laughs> but the problem is that pretty much everybody lies to us. Uh, and the way it works is this. We have an idea and we get all excited. Uh, and we're like, okay, I've got my idea. Uh, I'm gonna turn it into a business. So I go and I get my suit, looking pretty good. And I go out and I start talking to people. Uh, I line up meetings, I'm, I'm networking, I'm doing all this stuff. And I'm trying to make my idea better. I wanna find out if it's gonna work. I wanna find out how to take it to the next level. <laughs> but then when you actually get in these meetings, it's a bit hard. Like, Several of you mentioned that what was stopping you from making your businesses was that uh, either you didn't know the right people or that they didn't take you seriously because you're young. That was definitely my experience at my first company. We were selling to big advertisers and everyone I talked to, they were older than me, they were more successful than me, they were richer than me, they were better dressed than me. It was very intimidating. Um, but it turns out that you can actually learn how to run these conversations. It's very doable. Um, and <laughs> if you don't take control of the conversations, they kind of end up like a bad date. It's like neither of you really knows why you're there and you're talking to each other about your business, but it, it's like not sure, not clear what you're trying to figure out. You're sort of like, hey, this is my idea. What do you think? And they say, well, it sounds good. And you say, thank you. And they say, let me know when it launches, I guess. Like nothing really happens there. So you have to know what, what you're trying to, trying to make happen. And it's gotta be valuable too, because you're always balancing, um, I'm trying to talk to people and make my idea better, but I only have so much time. You know, time, time came up more than any other problem about what's stopping you from starting your business. We only have so much. Um, so when we go out and talk to people, we feel like we're being scientists we feel like we're, we're being very rational and, and learning and figuring out whether our idea is gonna work or whether our idea is not gonna work. <laughs> but imagine how that, that seems, right? You have an exciting new idea for a business and you go to someone and you say, okay, I've been thinking about this for a long time. You know I've always wanted to start a company. I finally did it. I dropped out of university. I quit my job. I left my dog, whatever. I'm starting my company. Here it is, what do you think? Like, what are people gonna tell you? They're gonna be like, yeah, man, that sounds great. Congratulations. Like, it's very hard to get honest feedback in this scenario. So we think we're asking people for real data, but what we're actually doing is, is we're kind of like, we're fishing for compliments. We're putting our ego on the line. Um, and what we'll get a lot of is we get compliments back. And I think compliments are one of the biggest enemies of trying to start a company. The more people you talk to who say nice things about your business, the more convinced you become it's a good idea. And then you risk too much of your time and too much of your money. Um, but we can't expect other people to always tell us the truth. And to be honest, they don't even know. Even professional investors are wrong something like 80 or 90% of the time. If professional investors are normally wrong, how can we trust like anyone to know whether our business is a good idea, right? So, so we get these compliments and we go back to our team and our team's like, hey, how, how is it going? Do they like our idea? You go, yeah, they loved it. Everyone says it's great. Um, <laughs> and then we realize that, that we built this product and it, it really doesn't work. Um, people don't buy it. Even those people who said, yes, I would definitely buy that, they don't. This happened to the, the first startup I ever worked for when I was still in university. 
we talked to a load of people and they all said, I love your business. I would definitely buy this product. And so the company spent about $10 million building a product and when they launched it, no one bought it. So we had to fire like 150 people uh, and we, we shut down the business. And it was totally needless. It's just they had asked bad questions. They had asked for feedback in a way which invited compliments instead of real data. So I really believe that compliments are the enemy and it's our job to avoid compliments when we're trying to figure out how to make our business work. Um, the easiest way to do that, can any of you guess what it's gonna be? How do you avoid compliments? Yeah. I think by being discreet in the manner in which you approach uh, your subject, or should I say, the subject matter, what you want to create, don't go straight into what you want to create. Ask it indirectly. All right, that's awesome. So be discreet about what you're trying to build. If you go in and you say, hey, I'm building this, what do you think? everyone will lie to you. They'll all be like, yeah, it's great. Uh, if you can go around, if you can, can uh, talk about them instead of your idea, uh, you get a lot better information. Because um, what we want to avoid is this feeling of fishing for compliments. Um, but if we're not talking about our idea, like what do we do? Um, and it's important to realize that, that new ideas, when they're really innovative, when they're new, they go through two different phases. The first one, you're trying to figure out what's going on, basically. You're trying to learn how the industry works, what people care about, uh, where are the problems, will they pay us money. Um, it's pretty big and open, and it actually doesn't involve your idea at all. Imagine if you were trying to build a new education business, right? Who's going to come up with a better idea? The person who completely understands education and the problems that teachers have and the problems people have learning? Or, or someone who knows nothing about it. It's like obviously the person who knows more uh, about the industry. So our first goal is to just learn about the industry and then later we come back to them. Once we've learned all we can and we say, here's my specific product, do you wanna buy it? And the do you wanna buy it is important because <laughs> if we just say, here's my product, what do you think? Or even worse, here's my idea, what do you think? We always get compliments. So you need to put them to a decision. Um, but at the beginning, we just don't talk about our idea. Instead, we talk about our customers, and we talk about their problems and their current solutions to their problems, uh, and what kind of budgets they have to solve those problems. And none of this requires us talking about our idea. Right? It's the craziest thing. You learn if your business is going to work by not talking about it. You, you talk about your customers. You ask about their life. You do exactly what you said. You go in discreetly. Uh, you want to learn what moves them. Because ultimately, every business, the reason people pay you, it's because you're making their lives better. You're either creating joy or you're removing pain. Right? That's what a business does. Um, and for that, there's value created, and sometimes they pay you. Um, so I want to do a quick, um, just a quick, it'll take two minutes. Um, we're going to break up into groups of three, so just kind of at your table in groups of three. And I'm going to give you a, a, a scenario. Um, <laughs> whoever has the longest hair in your group of three, um, you're going to be getting interviewed. Okay, so someone's going to be trying to ask you questions um, about how you tra plan your travel. Okay, so you're going on a trip in a few weeks, maybe you just came on this trip. They're trying to figure out like how you plan your travel. Whoever has the shortest hair in the group, you have an idea for a brilliant new startup. It's gonna help people plan their trips, okay? So it's gonna help them find flights, find hotels, decide where to go, find exciting tourist destinations. Um, maybe if a whole family is traveling, it'll help them all organize it together. Uh, so this is your idea and people are gonna pay you for this, right? So the shortest hair is trying to figure out if the travel planning app is a good idea. The longest haired person is gonna be answering their questions, but you don't wanna hurt their feelings. So never tell them their idea is bad, right? And whoever has the middle length hair in the group of three, I want you to take notes about what's happening and try to decide whether this is a good conversation or a bad conversation, okay? 
So this is just like you're talking to a customer and you're trying to figure out if your business is a good idea. But you don't want to bias them. You don't want them to be able to hurt your feelings. So we'll take two minutes. Does everyone have their groups of three? Go. Yep. Yeah, go, go, go. <laughs> All right. And I'll set a little timer. You've got a two minute conversation to figure out if this is going to work. Take it away. Go for it. All right, guys, you guys have two groups. So you guys have one group. You can do two groups of four. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> If you guys are just a group, that's fine. Just you ask questions and you, you answer. It'll be fun. seconds. That's time. So what, I want to pull out, who was one of the middle people in their group? Who was paying attention and taking notes? <laughs> How did that go? Just, will you tell us just kind of what, what, what you saw? Did you feel like there was information? Do you feel like they were asking good questions? What questions worked? Which ones didn't? Yes, actually he tried to talk about uh, travel for somewhere else. Actually, I don't remember the name, but he didn't. Punta Cana, I think somewhere like that. But he didn't tell him that it was a bad, really bad place and all of that, so he started talking about Miami is a very, very good place and they are offering all of these other perks that you can get. Well, you cannot get this in Punta Cana? Punta Cana. It was really good, actually. He was able to tell him directly that this place is better, don't bother yourself going for Punta Cana. Okay, so that started out as a conversation about travel and it ended up becoming kind of which is a better place to travel and why do you like one place over the other. Uh, so that might be good learnings for you. You might realize that it's quite important for your, your app to recommend. Like maybe people don't want to travel, they don't know exactly where they want to travel, they just want to go somewhere sunny or they just want to go somewhere nice. So that might be an important feature to build in. Um, and it didn't sound like that was biasing. Um, what was, who was one of the other spectators? Bum, bum, bum. Yeah, okay. How did, how did, how did, what happened here? I asked her what was she going to do like here in Costa Rica and she told me that she had to like get a car but she was concerned about the price of the car so I think the customer is like concerned about the price she doesn't have like a lot of money so I think that's the most important thing I talk with her. So that's great as well and kind of points toward a way we might be able to make money. One of the big questions was where do I find a car? Um, so that's also great. If we go into these conversations with our idea exactly as it's meant to be, then we sort of, for, we, we miss the opportunity to find out these extra ways that we could be making money. 
or these extra ways we could be creating value. Uh, what did you guys have going on? We, I asked her where she was traveling to. What she told me was that she gave me a feasibility study about what she was going to do. First of all, she gave me a social direction, she gave me an economic factor, and she talked about a political factor. Talking about the social factor, she, talking about the social one, the social factor talks about with the location where she's going for, whether she's going for fun. Talking about the economic factor, she talked about the price, the cost of going to that particular direction. And talking about the political factors, talked about the people living there, if, if they are accommodative. Thank you. Awesome. So that pulled out a bunch of other issues. Uh, what are the, the, the political motivations behind the trip? Um, this might be a whole travel niche that you could address. Certainly people who want low cost travel are well served already, but what about people who want to travel for these, these other reasons? You can't go to Orbitz or Expedia and, and search by you know, political uh, criteria. Um, so that might be great as well. This is actually one of my favorite ways to come up with startup ideas. Because if we sit around at a table and we just try to come up with an idea, we always end up coming up with the same ideas. We're like, oh, it's going to be a way to figure out which club to go to at night. It's like everybody has that idea. Um, or it's just because they're, they're kind of they're abstract. They're just floating out there. We're trying to just make up an idea on the spot. But if you learn there's a type of customer you care about, like maybe your mom was a nurse and you know how hard their days are and you really want to make nurses more effective and make their lives easier, you can go to nurses and just do this type of conversation and really understand what motivates them and what the problems are and how their job could be better. And suddenly you'll realize you've come up with 100 startup ideas. You don't need to have the idea before you start. All you need to know is the type of person whose life you want to make better. Uh, as you get to know that person, you'll find the ideas suddenly emerge. Cool? <laughs> yeah. So, although actually none of you really mentioned this morning that ideas were what was holding you back, but you can always have more ideas. <laughs> they don't do any harm. Um, real quick, I wanted to uh, change the subject. And there's sort of a special entrepreneur guest. <laughs> who you guys may already know from the day, um, but it's a cool story and he's sort of around to help out. So will you kind of say hello and tell us what's going on? So uh, Rob asked me to, to just help out because he's got a lot of people and uh, he just needed some other eyes to be able to go around and, and help out with the groups. I told him a little bit of the story and uh, I'll just do it very quick for you guys. Uh, Datawind, as you may or may not know, is a, uh, a, a mobile internet uh, access device company. So we manufacture low-cost tablets. We produce tablets for the uh, for the Indian government, and uh, we are uh, basically we come from a history of a mobile web. So that the problem that was being resolved, which kind of started the company, was mobile internet. And you know we were asking, you know, why doesn't mobile internet work? Uh, this was back 15 years ago, and everyone said, well, mobile internet will never work because you know images are too small and bandwidth, you know, bandwidth is too small. Images are too large. But we knew, coming from having a background of imaging technology, that you can compress simple images and get them through the web pretty quickly. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, in doing research on the web, you realize that images really only represent about 5%, 10% of the web anyway, 5% uh, being text, and the rest is all the back-end programming language. So we developed a technology which basically, it's an algorithm, web server-based technology, which basically delivers the web as you'd see it on your mobile device through a proxy server using a fraction of the amount of data. So when we surf the web on our mobile device, on our app, we're using about you know 3% of the amount of data that other devices will use. And what that does is it resolves the bandwidth limitations, especially in developing countries where you have little um, bandwidth in these remote areas. Uh, and so from our hardware background as well, we started developing these low-cost tablets. So now in India, we're selling you know tablets for on, you know, $40, $40, $2 a month, unlimited internet. And basically that resolves the problem, uh, you know, why mobile internet never work, and that's kind of where we came about. And now we have the number one selling brand tablet in India. 
So that's kind of where we come from. That's kind of the background that I'm in, education and getting tablets into education. But, you know, uh, so, you know, I'm just going to be around to help around, and that's kind of what our story is. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> so, that's, it, there's a bunch of different approaches to how you come up with business ideas. Um, one of them, which, like, you just heard a perfect example of, is noticing that there's a societal or technological wave and then being at the right place to take advantage of it. You're sort of like, this is inevitable. I see it coming. It's going to happen. I'm going to position myself in the right place. We're going to start now, even though it's too early. And by the time it becomes mainstream, like we're, we're there. Is that sort of a fair? Uh, and it's a bunch of the huge companies got built this way. And other people look at the opportunities and they go, oh, that'll never work. Look how tiny it is. But they don't see where it's going. Um, so if you can spot those, that's great. Um, another way, which I want to take a couple minutes and, and, and think about, and is that there, there was a lot of research done on the way some successful entrepreneurs go about, uh, go about new businesses. And one of the myths is that they choose a vision and just find any way to get there. Some do, for sure, and some have made it work. Um, but what most do is they, they, they know what they care about, um, but then they look at the resources they have available already, and they figure out what they could do with those resources. And this is actually pretty cool, because if you're using your own connections and your own resources, no one else can compete with you, because they're not you. Right? It leads to ideas that, that, that come from what you're good at. So what I want to do is I want to take, we're going to take a couple kind of 90 seconds and just build out some lists. And the first one is going to be all of the, the communities, all of the groups of people that you think like you have some connection to or you care about. Uh, so me, it would be like people who like board games and teachers and entrepreneurs and investors and small business owners. There's all these people that I have some connection to and who I would be interested in helping. Um, and any of these, like I know their problems a little bit and I have a way to talk to them. So we're going to take 60 seconds. I want you to write down as many different communities and groups of people as you can that you have some connection into. It could be people your parents know. It could be people through your university. It could be your past work experience. All the different communities you've got. Uh, 60 seconds. And go. And just start writing. There's no, there's no dumb ideas. Just write the dumb ones down as well. <laughs> and do this, do this individually. As many as you can get. Go, go, go. Ten seconds. <laughs> Volume matters. Just keep writing. The more you get down, the better. All right, that's time. Now, I want you to think about individual people. So I can program, but I'm a terrible designer. So whenever I need something designed, I rely on my friends who are good at design. I want you to write down the names of specific people who, if you needed to, they would come over for the weekend and help you. They have a skill they're great at. I know a guy named Devin. He's an awesome designer. Whenever I need design, I buy him a bunch of beers, and he helps me out. Like, who are the people that could come to your aid? Or like, I have old business connections through my dad, and if I was in an emergency, I could go to them. Who are the specific people you could reach out to? Maybe it's the person who brought you to this conference. Maybe it's your favorite teacher, and he has industry connections. Who are the specific people who could help you? Um, 
Again, 60 seconds. Get down as many as you can. Who are the best people you know? You don't have to know them that well. You can always find an excuse to get to know someone better. <laughs> Now, the people you know are, are so important, but what matters is that you don't need them to join your company full time, right? You don't need to convince someone to quit their job in order for them to be able to help you. You can use a little bit of people's time, and it opens up so many possibilities. You know, if you, get, if you can't program and you get your buddy for a weekend, bam, suddenly you've got a website. If you can't design and you've got someone for an hour, suddenly he'll help you figure out which fonts to use. This stuff can make a real difference. One introduction email can totally open up your business. Um, so these individual people you know, and they're a special resource because they're totally unique to you. Now, I want to take slightly longer. We're going to take uh, three minutes. And working in, in groups of, again, sort of three or four, I want everyone at the table to come up with at least one, but hopefully more than one, idea. And what you're going to do is you're going to take one of the communities that you wrote down, and you're going to take one of the people who could help you, and you're going to figure out what would happen if you combine them. So if it was you plus that person trying to build a business for that community, what would that business look like? What could you do with your skills and their skills for this type of person? Does that make sense? Does, who, does, it, does it not make sense to anyone? <laughs> uh, do you guys get it? Okay. You're, the tables will help. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we'll take, actually, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take three, we'll see where we get with three minutes. Three businesses, three minutes, it'll work great. All right, go. So combine a community plus a person. What can you build for them? You don't need to judge it right now. You don't need to figure out if it's a good idea. Just get them on the table, you know? <laughs> you can figure out if they're good later. <laughs> One minute left.
That's time. So, could I get a, a couple people to volunteer to just talk us through your thinking and what you came up with? Okay, so uh, this is uh, my partner so far. And uh, we've uh, looked at the following aspects. He's going to talk about the teaching application. And I'll, I come by, fortunately enough, we we're thinking under the same direction. So I thought about teachers and lecturers as well. So those are the two subjects that you have. Um, teaching in the sense that there is a need every time you teach to be assured that if the pupil hasn't understood, there's a probability that that pupil will understand later, uh, despite the teacher not being present. So that requires an after lesson or some kind of a tutoring way. And in terms of ICT, how we can tutor using ICT is simply by bringing in animation uh, that is synonymous to what you're teaching. So in that sense, we thought of developing that kind of application, starting from lower grades to uh, university as well. Why do we lack a visual aspect of learning in the university? Maybe because people don't want to develop visual aspects that are synonymous to what they're studying. Uh, that can further extend to even particular fields that you're studying in. I'll give over the mic, is it okay? Okay, the community I was thinking about is uh, students and teachers. There are a lot of apps in Colombia that help you grade your students. But when they log in to see their, their grades, they only see their final grade for that class. So since I'm a developer, I was thinking about making an app that would help the student log in and he could see every single assignment he did on that semester. And I joined with a the person I know in that community, that I was a teacher before, and I know the chancellor of the university I was, and maybe putting them uh, together, I know that if I develop the app, uh, she would implement it in that university. Thanks. That, that, that sounds like, like a good idea, right? And it's credible, it's easy to believe in because it's not just an idea, it's an idea and I know this person with this experience who's going to help me do it and you, I've even got my first customer. It, it goes from being just an idea to like, hey, we're going to make this happen, right? And that's because you didn't just choose a random idea, you anchored it in either people that you know or people you care about and the skills that you have access to. Ideas get much, much better the more personal you can make them. Uh, you're more able to do it, right? Uh, the worst thing is you choose an idea and you go, okay, I've got a great idea. I just need half a million dollars and a programmer. Because <laughs> then like it may as well, it's never going to exist, right? Like you gotta, you start with something that you can do today. Um, so yeah, that, that's great. Does, is there kind of, um, does someone else wanna, wanna talk through theirs? Bum, 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 cool. Um, yeah, hello. Uh, we had a, actually not bad idea. Uh, basically, uh, my colleagues here are in IT management and web development, and uh, I was more in accounting and project management, so we couldn't be more different. So we started to think, how could we, you know, work together? Uh, so they told me that they were very, you know, talented with uh, creating applications. And, I, and they, they also have, you know, connections with private companies and stuff. And I do know NGOs and accounting companies and other private companies. So I said, uh, so we came up to a conclusion that we would create like a web development, like we would create an application, they would create it. And we would get in contact with medium-sized companies and small companies because they can't afford to do like hire many accountants and to have like a sophisticated accounting software. We created an application where they can do their accounting and uh, they could do a project management instead of going up to another company and paying a lot of money for it. Okay. 
So, like, if that was pitched to me and I was an investor, I'm kind of like, I have no idea. I don't know how accountancies work. But then you're like, I understand accountancies. I understand project management. S suddenly, it's much easier for me to believe that that's going to work. And you kind of have the connections to make it happen. Um, so yeah, that's, that's great. Um, <laughs> the, the last thing I want to the last thing I want to say about talking to people is once we start to figure out exactly what our product is going to be, um, like we've now got this idea, and it's in our heads, and we start falling in love with our our, our idea. We need to. Whoop. What's going on? Oh, cuando es que por acá tenemos otra idea. Oh yeah, sure. Well, our idea is aimed at the communities of rural schools. So, our idea, our idea is aimed to companies that have social responsibility programs. So, through advertising for fundraising, we want to manage these companies to provide funds to give computers uh, at low prices to students who are in rural areas and schools in rural areas because the problem that we have in rural schools is that the quality of education is poor and so the idea is to have a system in these computers to allow students to go hand in hand with the st uh, classes that they're taught in school to develop these um, their knowledge using computers thank you Is there? <laughs> What's up? <laughs> All right, one more. Hi. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Costa Rica. <laughs> um, we were thinking about developing a software that may help uh, the medical sector in Costa Rica because um, we have the main problem here that for surgeries, uh, they take a long time, so it takes like uh, four, five to six years to, for you to get a surgery appointment. And then when you get to the appointment, they tell you you have to reschedule that because uh, some of the, uh, the appliances, so those things doesn't work. So we were thinking about developing a software uh, where all the people, or Costa Ricans in this case, can access uh, to the application and they can sign for uh, these appointments and make our doctors to have access to that community so they realize uh, how, how much people or how many people um, are requiring uh, those things. And um, I guess that would be something that may help our community. We will realize because we have a lot of people working on that sector uh, to get all those appointments, and um, I guess that will improve the um, the way to get those appointments, and we wouldn't have to wait a long time and wait until someone that, that we uh, love may die just waiting for an appointment or to practice surgery. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, terrific. Um, the we. We like we we get the ideas. Ideally, they come from a place that's connected to us, so that we can make real progress on them, uh, and so that you care about it as well. It's much more fun to work on a business you care about. Uh, you don't have to, but it you know it, it helps you stay excited. Um, and once we get our idea, once we know what it is that that we want to build, we kind of need to put it in front of people, right? Because you can't just go around with it in your head forever. Um, but when, when we do that, we need to make them work for it a little bit. Because if we just say, hey, here's my idea, do you like it? Everybody says yes. We need to say, like, hey, here's my idea. You can have it if you pay me. Or like, you can have it if you work a bit. That way, we, we, we know that they're being serious. And when we go back and we tell our team, hey, they liked it, we know that's true. Um, 
the three things we can ask for is we can ask for their money, we can ask for their time, and we can ask for their reputation. Um, money is probably obvious. If they buy your product, you know they liked it. <laughs> if they pay for the service, if they donate to your cause, you know that that means a lot to them. Uh, time, I mean, if someone looks at your demo for five minutes, that doesn't mean that much. If they'll commit to two weeks to use it every day as a trial, then you can take that a lot more seriously. Uh, if they'll let you write a public case study about them, then they're putting their reputation on the line. Uh, if they'll make an introduction to their boss, that means a lot. All of these, it's ways that you can get them to start committing even before you've built the whole business. You can say, hey, I have an idea. It's this and this. And they go, they go oh, I love it. That sounds great. And you go, awesome. Like, who can you introduce me to? And they say, ooh, nobody then you know they didn't actually like it as much as they said. Um, so all of these are ways of kind of, kind of getting to the truth. Um, there's also some other ways of coming up with ideas which are, are quite interesting. Um, have you all seen, do, 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 where's this picture? Have you all seen this picture before? Um, this is the, uh, this is, Facebook's friend graph, basically. So there's a little line between everyone who's friends. Um, and it doesn't actually have the shape of the world on it. It's just you can kind of tell because people are friends. Um, and it's pretty neat. And one of the, the big changes in the, in the, the, the kind of ICT in the startup world lately is that we now have these enormous networks that we're able to build on top of if we want to. And some people say it's a bad idea because you give away control. Other people say it's a good idea because if it works, you can expand really, really quickly. Um, but it's quite powerful. Um, and there's a huge amount of work that we used to have to do ourselves that, that now we just don't have to do. Um, when someone logs into your app using Facebook, you immediately know exactly who they are. You know who their friends are. Um, that can be used for evil, and it can also be used in good ways. Um, that's kind of up to you as the, uh, as the entrepreneur, but it, it's powerful. Um, like, beyond building on top of Facebook, there's, you know, and Twitter and the others, there's some other cool options. So Twilio, you might have seen before. Um, how many of you guys have seen Twilio? <laughs> I'm sure it's more than that. I know raising hands isn't very fun. <laughs> um, so Twilio lets your website send people text messages. It lets you send SMSs through your website. And it lets, you can respond to phone calls. You can respond to SMS. So suddenly, you can program with the phone, which for a lot of the world, that's incredible. Um, even like when my website goes down, I have Twilio send me a text message. And it goes, oh no, Rob, your site's down. And I panic. <laughs> but it's good, because I'm getting the message. Um, another option for, for sending, sending phone stuff is, is text it. This is so cool as well. You don't even need to program to use this one. You can just say, send this SMS. And then they, they message us something back. And we can respond to the messages and ask more questions. You can build a whole business that works through SMS without ever needing to program anything. Tools like this exist for everything you could ever want to do. Like any kind of infrastructure which you think you need to build yourself, you don't. Um, so let's take a minute. What kind of business, if it was within your group, if that group, if you were all co-founders, and you were using each other's skills and each other's connections, what business would you build that's based around, or social enterprise or charity, whatever you want, that's based around this ability to use text messages and use phone calls as logic? You know, it opens up all of the developing world and it gives us huge new options for, for you know, anyone who already has a smartphone as well. Uh, what would you do with this, using this technology? Well, just 
go kind of within, within the groups. Um, we'll take three minutes. What's the best SMS business that you can come up with? All right, take it away. About 45 seconds left. Think of it. You're able to get information and back and forth to whole parts of the world that it's a real pain to get to at the moment. Um, what can you do with this? What possibilities does this open up? And you can do it today. There's no cost. The tech is ready. You could launch this business by tonight if you started right now. That's time. So we, we happen to have someone here with a bit of expertise in this area. So I'm going to pass over the mic so we can get a real world story. Hello, everybody. I'm Sid from Zambia in Africa. And um, we came up with a platform. I didn't invent it. I was part of the consulting team of it. It was funded by UNICEF. And it's called U-Report. And basically, what it was is that uh, nurses in rural areas use their cell phones, any cell phone that you can use, uh, even a normal Nokia smartphone, I mean, little uh, prepaid phone. And what you do is, what they did is they used that to send text messages to report HIV cases. Um, so every time they, they took a test, they would send um, to a central server an SMS saying whether it's positive or negative. And that in turn built up a database of uh, statistics of AIDS cases in Zambia. So yeah, basically that was SMS there. That's brilliant. So using SMS to track the spread of HIV and kind of know what's happening around, around the country. Um, and that we were just chatting for a second and that was basically built from scratch, which means it was quite expensive. You would need a big organization to build something like that. But now you guys could duplicate that overnight if you had the connections to the, the nurses and the government, right? Um, the, the technology that's available for us at the, the platform layer, the tools that we have access to, it's insane how much we can do with them. So one of the other ways we can come up with businesses is to look at the new tools that are available and think, what would I do with that? Okay, so hi, I'm Beatrice. Um, so my team came up with this idea of, cre sorry, of creating a database uh, based on the needs of people. For example, for doctors to send a message to their patients to remember them to take their pills or for any other kind of like, if, for example, in business, they could create this um, SMS-based technology to send you when you have to go to a meeting and so on. 
and that of course you have to know the doctors in your country and of course to implement it throughout the, the, all the medical I don't know community so that was their idea our idea okay thank you Okay, so uh, we kind of got multiple different ideas. So uh, one of us, um, well, one of us lives in, uh, in New York, works there, and uh, he suggested that uh, since everyone's living a busy lifestyle and you really don't have that much time on your hands, uh, maybe you could send a message, like an SMS, to this number, which would find your location and would track down other people who are also um, maybe heading to one destination, for example. And uh, it, would, it would give you their location, and that way you could do a sort of carpool thing. Uh, there's also one idea, one, another person who gave an idea where uh, you could uh, contact um, emergency services via SMS, giving your specific information, which is quicker than calling 911. Um, and uh, they would also it would give you uh, tips to deal with the situation until the until help arrives. And uh, finally, uh, an app where which um, what was it again? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. and um, one more app which uh, which uh, connects your family to you. So uh, where whenever you have a life event, um, you can easily share this with your family, uh, no matter where you are in the world. So just with one simple SMS, and uh, we thought that was a great idea. Cool. Yeah, I love them. <laughs> Sorry, and, oh, and we missed your clap as well, so we'll clap for you also. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I want to, oh, um, a couple, I just want to show you guys like a couple more tools that, that you could have access to uh, if you wanted it, just so you get an idea of what's out there. Um, if I can find my little menu. So Kickstarter we talked about. If you have a product idea, you can put it up on Kickstarter and see if people will buy it before you ever build it. Incredible, right? Um, there's, <laughs> have you guys seen Alibaba? Yeah, amazing, right? You can buy like the whatever you want, really, at wholesale prices, and they'll deliver it to your country. You pick it up from the port in a 40-foot shipping container, and suddenly you're like a retailer. <laughs> I know a guy whose first business is he bought like hundreds of go-karts off of Alibaba, you know, like little cars. And then he, he, he sold them to kids in his neighborhood. He became a go-kart dealer. <laughs> like that was, how he, that was how he got started in business. And now he's a really, he just, he does this. He looks for products. Um, it's available to anyone. You can just go on there and buy whatever you want. Um, if you want to take uh, payments online, you've got tools like uh, Stripe, which make it so easy to take people's money. You used to have to sign up for merchant accounts and payment processing and all this stuff. It was a nightmare. Now in 20 minutes, bam, you're taking money over the internet. Um, but let's say that you don't want to use the internet. You want to take money in person. You can call someone like Square and they'll send you this little accessory that plugs into your phone and suddenly you can swipe credit cards into your phone and take money. It's like if you want to set up a market stall or an in-person business, like suddenly everyone in the market can now process credit cards. It's totally insane. And they give you this for free because they want to be, they want, they, you know? Like the way this is changing business is just completely incredible. Um, like cash only businesses are going, going digital. Um, Someone brought up earlier that one of the important things to, for a career of entrepreneurship is to keep knowing what's going on. And I totally agree with that, but it's more than just the trends. You also want to know what technology you have available to you. Because you can use and remix and be creative with this technology, uh, and suddenly it's like your businesses cost zero dollars to make. <laughs> and that's way better. Um, 
A couple other just cool businesses that I want to highlight because they're a little bit weird and you probably haven't thought of anything like this before. <laughs> Has anyone seen Hero Rats? So you see these giant rats? Guess what they do? Well, you can probably read it on the web page. <laughs> so this business uses rats to detect landmines. And they work as an alternative to military solutions, which either blow the whole field up with dynamite to blow up the landmines, or send people around to dig them up, uh, or roll a tank over the fields to try to blow everything up. But these rats, they can sm <laughs> they're kind of cute. They can smell explosives, and so they run up to it. They don't, they don't set it off. They're not heavy enough. They run up to it, and they, they start trying to dig it up, and then someone goes behind them with a shovel, digs it up, disarms it, uh, sells the metal for scrap. It's crazy. You're not going to sit around in the kitchen and be like, be like, ah, what would a good startup be? I know. I'll use rats for landmine detection. <laughs> You're just not going to come up with that. Um, this comes from being out in the world, and suddenly, and you know, and you put the pieces together. I think one of the best things you can do for, for an entrepreneurial career is to live life and go around and meet people and be curious. Ask them what they do. Ask them how it works. Ask them how the industry is. Ask them what the big problems are. Um, and these guys really took it to another level as well. Um, they basically, they, they take guys who, um, they take villagers, uh, subsistence farmers, and they actually set up universities there, like accredited universities. And they take the, the subsistence farmers and they get trained in veterinary care and animal training. And they leave with master's degrees in both. So in addition to having a job and clearing landmines, they're also taking people and like giving them master's degrees. And through all of this, they're making money. So they don't need to spend time collecting donations. It makes enough money by charging the governments for landmine removal that they can keep doing this for as long as they want. They, they don't depend on anyone else because it's a working business. Um, they recently also moved. They realized the rats could also detect tuberculosis. Um, and so now they're saving lives like that as well. And they, they sell the rats to hospitals. Kind of. I'm simplifying the business, but basically. It, it's, like, it's very cool. Um, Another one I love is Husk Power Systems, which works out of the Indian rice belt. And they take what used to be a waste material, uh, the rice husks, and they found a way to build a processing plant for it so that they could turn the rice husks into power. But then they didn't want to bring in a bunch of consultants and concrete and all this stuff. So they also, before they set up a power system, they first set up a university. And they train a bunch of the people there in um, like uh, electrical engineering and construction. So again, they, they get degrees. Uh, and they use all of the native materials to build the power grid. And it's this incredible, it's an extra revenue stream for the rice farmers. It's education for the workers. It uses all local materials. And it makes enough money that again, they don't need donations. It's a functioning business. So they're able to reach a lot more locations more quickly than they would if they needed to wait for donations or government grants. Um, and again, like you're never gonna think about this idea. Like I would never think about it, right? Because I don't know the situation. Um, and that's why there's, there's countless opportunities because each of your lives is showing you these different places where innovation and entrepreneurship can make a real difference, um, whether it's for your life or your community or whatever you want. Um, it's just kind of, it's that curiosity, right? The best entrepreneurs I've met, they're always asking questions. They'll sit down for a haircut and the barber will, and they'll ask the barber how he makes money. You know, they'll go for a taxi cab ride and they'll ask the taxi driver what he thinks of smartphones and whether they're making his job easier or harder. Um, just like get in that habit of asking questions uh, and suddenly you'll see startup ideas everywhere. Um, 
So I want to do, uh, bup, bup, bup. let me see here. I want to do one, well, yeah. I'll show you, uh, this was one of my businesses that failed, but was quite interesting. Um, and it kind of ties together a few of, um, a few of the, the, the things we've talked about. I, <laughs> I wanted to build this technology to help people at conferences, like me, who were speaking, get more Twitter activity. So the idea is while I'm speaking, uh, you guys would all be like ferociously tweeting about how great I am. <laughs> um, and I was going to make this technology which would make that happen more. The problem is, I didn't actually know if the technology was going to work, and it was going to be quite difficult to build. And I didn't want to build something if I wasn't sure it would even work. Um, how would you guys resolve this? Well, so in this case, uh, it was sort of test it, ask people. Uh, we could definitely do that. But in this case, I'm actually worried about the technology. Like, I know speakers want it. I just don't know if it actually works. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, if the technology works. Or if it's effective. So. Oh, so it was one of these things, uh, the question was how I thought of the idea. And I was just at conferences, and I was like, oh, I was hanging out with other speakers. I knew a ton of speakers, so I thought if I made this product, I'll know people I can get to use it. So it seemed like I kind of had the connections. Um, the approach I took is I went to a conference, and I talked to speakers, and I said, hey, I'm building this product, but it doesn't exist yet can I pretend that I'm the product and just give me access to your Twitter account and give me your slides and I'll do everything that my software is meant to do for you and we'll see if it works. And the idea was that if they wouldn't agree to this, then I kind of knew that the product wasn't going to, they didn't want it. And if they did agree, then I could measure whether or not it was actually effective. Um, and so then I just typed it all into a spreadsheet and it, it actually kind of worked, so that convinced me to get some friends together and build the product. Um, but we knew it worked because I pretended to be my software. You know, I was just like, oh, I could do that. And a lot of... ...technology and start to automate it. It's a great way to get going. Do it by hand. You know, get started. Don't wait. You don't need to wait to build your website. Like, start doing it today. Um, you can charge people later. Um, another time, oh, yeah. Oh, why didn't it work? Um, so the reason it didn't work is because <laughs> speakers are very unprepared, typically. <laughs> Just to generalize. <laughs> and so the environment they were meant to be using it in is very chaotic. They're rushed, they're panicked. And they show up and they're like, they're like, oh yeah, I meant to use that new software. And then they, they're like, ah, and they're already late. And they're like, what do I do? And so they just didn't. So it was one of these things where they, they wanted to use it, they liked it, but in practice, the realities of their situation, it just didn't work out. Um, and that was something that we could only really learn by giving it to them. If we'd spent a year planning, then we would have wasted the whole year. But as it was, we were able to figure that out pretty quickly, which I was happy for. You guys hear that rain? I'm glad we're in here. <laughs> um, and another time I had an idea that it was still about conferences, and we were, the idea was it was gonna help conference organizers find and hire speakers. And I wanted to know if any organizers would actually pay for it, and I wanted to know if speakers wanted these connections. So again, I didn't wanna build the whole website, so I sent them emails. I sent the conference organizers an email, and I said, hey, I'll find you any speaker you want for 20 euros a piece. Uh, and I emailed speakers, and I said, hey, is it cool if I send you speaking gigs? Both sides said, yeah, that would be great. And we ended up doing something like 1,000 pounds of revenue in the first day. 
It's like $1,500. Before we ever had a website, we just sent emails. And then later we're like, okay, this works, so it's time to build the website. It's just like, it's how small can you make that first step? <laughs> so what I want to do to kind of close us out, um, we've got a little bit of time left. Um, ba -ba -ba. Uh, we've got a little bit of time left, but I want to slow it down a bit. And I want you guys to kind of decide what you want to do next. You could do anything. You could do nothing. The normal choice would be to do nothing. You know, you leave here, you fly back home, you do nothing. That's fine, you graduate, then you're like, oh, I should start a business. But then you still have all the problems you have today. <laughs> or we could like start something now, and then later, you're in a much better position, right? Later you have the audience, you have the connections, you have the co-founders, you have the reputation. So what I want to do is, is what do you think that you actually want to do in the next, say, two weeks? What are you going to start building? Is it a side project? Is it a blog? Is it a community? What's the company that you want to eventually head toward? And what can you start doing now to make that happen? Um, and let's take, uh, let's take five minutes on that. So not a huge amount of time, because there's no sense, no sense worrying forever about it. Uh, and then we're also going to pull out uh, who's going to kind of be the representative of, uh, of this session uh, to, to make our case in front of the UN later. <laughs> um, but first, for you, like, what can you do? What do you want to do in the next week or two weeks that's going to make a real difference? What are you going to start on? If it's nothing, that's fine. Just help someone else figure out what they want to do. But if you do want to do something, that would be, that would be best. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna wander around and try to be helpful. Does that does anyone not understand? And when I say do something, I don't mean think. Thinking is not work. <laughs> what can you do to actually start start the first step of a business? Uh, what's your first stepping stone? to open up this new partnership or this new sales avenue. You know, so you might think, what's the first step to make that happen? Uh, up to you.
If anybody at your table is totally stuck, now is a good time to start helping them. <laughs> About two minutes left. seconds. time. So what are some of these first steps? Remember, we don't need to get all the way to the destination. Uh, we're just trying to figure out what we can do in the next couple weeks. Um, Who will kick us off here? It's just a one-liner. In the next couple weeks, I'm going to I want to basically bring together, because I've been participating to a lot of uh, youth conferences this summer, I think all of them that happened at the UN, and I think the best idea that I can come up with is to bring everything together on, let's say, I don't know, a blog, and actually bring all the good ideas, all the network that I created, and put it in a place where people who couldn't uh, attend these conferences be able to take them uh, to their home places, especially, for example, Romania, I was basically the only one from Romania in the majority of these conferences, so I would like to take everything that I've learned and seen back to Romania, one way or another. You guys think that's a good use for a couple of weeks? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you got a mic behind here. Yes. Oh, right here. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so I'm. I've come from the world of global democracy and online deliberative decision making, but I'm right now uh, working on a project that's using Bitcoin uh, to create public funds that can be governed by the members of a, of a fund that goes to a single discrete Bitcoin account. Uh, but I've slowly over the last few months been assembling this hodgepodge team of professors and PhD students in a few different fields. And uh, we have some Skype conferences coming up. So it's not much, but that's in the next two weeks what's on the horizon. And if anyone here is at all interested in any of that stuff, yeah, you're more than welcome to uh, get involved. Cool. Bringing together all the moving pieces. Sounds good. Okay, so um, we're working on, in Zambia right now, we're working on a, a way to sell prepaid talk time via an Android device. So in third world and developing countries, there's a lot of prepaid phones, you know how that is. So you buy the scratch cards, and that costs the mobile networks money. And in turn, the profits to the people selling those cards are lower. 
So we have a device um, that hangs around your neck and you press a button depending on how much you want and it prints out a credit in, on a little voucher, very small thing. And that is what we're working on. If you have any questions, please and let me know. In the next couple of weeks, you totally skip the next couple of weeks for us? <laughs> next couple of weeks, so uh, we have uh, made connections with the mobile networks there so that we're developing the platform further. Yeah, so I'm Claude from Rwanda. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I run uh, a tech hub called K Lab, and uh, I like everything you're talking about because uh, myself, I help I help young entrepreneurs and uh, coming up with businesses. Uh, I like the approach of first identifying a group and then someone who can help. Uh, I saw that even uh, in one of your style, you have the business model canvas, which I mainly use in my country. Uh, I hope to implement what I have seen back home. And uh, I just visited your blog, and uh, there's a lot of resources. I didn't know you. Actually, it's my first time to see you. Uh, I already even followed you on Twitter. So I hope to learn more <laughs> from you and the blog, and also uh, maybe we'll have you in Rwanda sometime soon, because I saw that you even like to talk to uh, young people. And lastly, Textit, the tool you mentioned, was developed at K-Lab by Nyaruka. Nyaruka is a software company that sits at K-Lab. They are mentors at K-Lab. So it was really interesting to see you referring to their tool. I also even tweeted them uh, that you spoke about their product here in Costa Rica. So thank you. Cool. Thank you. Now, we have kind of a cool opportunity uh, this, this week. Oh, you've got uh, something to kick off? Do we have uh, one more mic floating around? Yeah. Cool. Bonjour, euh, je m'appelle euh, Bouba Karbou, euh, je suis du Sénégal. Je suis du Sénégal. My team and I have developed an app that has a social impact on the seconds that follow what all have learned here. I hope to improve my application because the app has a social impact and it helps and it helps the workers communicate with people like you and I it helps them at the school level to better their lives thank you very much Some of, I hope that all of you guys really will will take these these first steps, whatever they are. The first steps could be as small as writing your first blog post or making your first YouTube video talking about something you care about, or they could be a big sales or a big partnership or, or beginning your technology or talking to a first customer. Uh, any of these are great. They're that that first stepping stone. They're the humble beginnings, but they, they build up over time. Uh, and if you get into the habit of every week, you say, what's the, the thing I could do this week that's most important? What's the thing that, you know, the most important thing to learn about my business? The riskiest, the scariest piece? Um, then you'll find that you're just able to move so fast. Uh, you know, and you'll, it'll blow your mind how much you can get done in three months. Um, you know, you can, completely build a company in three months. Um, but we've got 15 minutes left, and we've got a cool opportunity tonight. Um, because uh, two of you guys uh, will kind of get a chance to tell the UN what they should fix, which is great. Um, and I don't know, but I'm hoping that some of you guys do. And so I want to do two things. Um, first, we're going to choose, um, and we don't necessarily need to do this in any, any particular order, um, but if you've got thoughts 
on, on what we might be able to change. Um, can we just form like a queue of people here? And I just want you to kind of come up and, and tell us what it is. Um, what do you think, like, if, if, the, the, if entrepreneurship is to be made easier, if bringing technology to scale is to be made more possible, what could we do to make this happen? Um, and then we're also going to, uh, hopefully a couple people want to do this. Because I think it would be a shame if we had this opportunity and didn't use it to tell them something you care about, right? It's like you're not going to get this chance again, so take it. Um, and then we're also going to choose like a couple people to, to actually give that message. We'll collect what kind of everyone says, uh, and then we can pass that on tonight. Sound good? Cool. So who will come up? Can we just form kind of a, we'll just build a line here? I know a bunch of you guys have things to say. Yeah, all right, we've got our, our first volunteer, second. Yeah, keep it coming. <laughs> nice. Bring it up, bring it up. <laughs> cool. And uh, this isn't like your only chance. Feel free to come up as they're talking. Um, cool. So to give you guys some context, um, what, what, what you're going to be kind of sharing uh, this afternoon, it's just five, ten minutes. It's not long, and most of that they're going to ask you questions for. So you really only need to talk for like 30 seconds. <laughs> and basically, it'll be like a two-second version of what we did here. And if there's anything that you're going to do differently because of it, and then what you'd love to see the UN help make happen so that, that entrepreneurship can you know, can flourish, and so that we can get technology, uh, technology out there. So, will you, uh, will you take things away? And just, we, we sort of all know what the workshop was about, hopefully. So we can just focus on, uh, you know, what you think would be useful policy. Um, my general thoughts that the ITU should confront with a lot of uh, brainstorming powers with regards to cybersecurity, because it's concerning. It is termed cybersecurity, however, the, s the policies in place are toothless. There's nothing much being done in terms of safety uh, online, especially with underdeveloped countries. Very few people have knowledge about the safety usage of ICTs. And if they don't have knowledge, someone has to protect them prior to acquiring that knowledge. So much as we want to create, create technology, we have to consider the priority, which is the backbone of it all. It's, we're not going to be creating technology so that we can enhance crime in this world of ours. We want it to be safe. So in that case, I think what we need to do is create a safer environment using ICTs. Uh, just to conclude, it doesn't make sense. Why should we create if we're creating crime? Why should we create if we're unable to protect? Why should we create if it's unsafe for others? So I think that is a very major issue that the United Nations should work on, and they should make sure that it is achieved. Is it impossible, should I ask? I think that's why we're here. We're here to be challenged. Is it impossible or is it possible? Can it be achieved? I remember uh, President Barack Obama of the United States saying, it is not possible to achieve 100% security based on the hackings that are going on in this world. So why can't we achieve even 1% of it? Thank you very much. So what I'm about to tell you, I think that the UN should stay well away from, and I hope they never do it. So I'm not really addressing this to the UN. Um, if Satoshi Nakamoto is in the room, though, uh, listen up. So I think, I, I think a lot about identity and how we express it and how we share it. And identity in the 21st century is two things. If nothing else, it's digital and it's global. And we have a lot of great systems of digital identity. I'm sure we all have Facebook, we all have a plethora of emails, we all have multiple online identities. And they're very useful for a lot of things. Some of them are anonymous or pseudonymous. Uh, some of them we have multiple of. And it's, if you're a Syrian human rights activist right now, it's really great that you can have, let's say, an email account that isn't inherently attached to who you are. And I think that's really important, and that's one of the vibrant things about the internet. But there are certain interactions that we do with one another where I think it is important 
that there is only one identity within a given system that you have access to, or what I would call a bijective online identity. And someone we need to, we need, someone needs to figure this out. And I think it needs to be distributed, peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, without any kind of centralized hierarchy. But we need to have some system of global identity, a global identity number, perhaps, or something, in which you only have access to one of them, and you, can, you are the only one who can access that identity. Because once we have that, we can open up an interesting domain of things such as global elections. Just as a heads up, the, the queue is growing, so I'm going to cut you guys off at 30 seconds. Okay. So. <laughs> okay. Good evening. My name is Juan Pablo. I'm from Mexico. I study economics, and I think uh, that information and internet is the real key for transaction and for a fair trade. So my proposal to the UN is make the internet as a right to, in order to forecast the information that is helpful is helpful for markets so people who are producers from agriculture coffee or any commodities can get access to the real prices of the markets and they can get the real benefits thank you well good afternoon my name is Jose Wilfredo. I am from El Salvador. I will try to express my idea on English, and if I can't, I, I will do it in Spanish. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, in my fifth, uh, fifth year of uh, engineering telecommunications. So uh, my proposal for the United Nations is that it's so hard to uh, start your enterprise when you have an injustice uh, market around you. Uh, maybe the big, uh, the big uh, companies will be agree to don't let you grow. Yeah, they will think um, take you out of the market, and yeah, that uh, uh, must be regulated. For uh, example, lo siento, le voy a explicar. For example, I'm sorry, but I'll explain in Spanish. It's difficult to start a business when you have stiff and uh, unloyal competition, and you know that you're fighting the big guys. And they can agree to get you out of the market because they see that you're growing, which perhaps is good for you, but it might not be good for a third party. And so they can keep in line two friction forces, but perhaps the third one is not convenient for them. So even a small entrepreneur might be a danger to them and they might want to get you out of the market. So we need better laws to control this and not to prevent a, a company because just because they're big and multinational doesn't mean they have to dominate the market. Hello, uh, my name is Talal, I'm from Lebanon. Uh, I think that ITUs in general should focus on a number of things. The first thing I think is food which is the most important thing. We can actually work with microfinance institutions uh, and private companies to try to get food to the developing world. We're talking about Africa, uh, Central Asia, many parts of the world, because you still have a large per percentage of people who, can't, uh, who are not even eating. So if you can't eat, you can't think or implement things on the ground. Uh, the second thing that uh, we would like to do is to create access, uh, and we talked about this point a lot, uh, access to internet and computers for the developing world because that's like the largest per percentage of the population if they start moving forward the whole world will move forward uh, a third step would be is education online free education there are certain websites like allison they give you free math courses free finance free science physics whatever the course may be so you can move forward and this should be in all itus in the world so people, even if they don't have money for an education, they can do something about it, take online courses, and slowly move forward in their life. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Botan from Iraq. Uh, many times I try to start my own business, but every time I fail. And uh, one of the reasons that, because we are in Iraq, we 
somehow uh, disconnect from the other world. For example, when I go to Google, a uh, place where I cannot buy anything because most of the website, most of the transactions are blocked from Iraq. So there is uh, like a barrier between Iraq and the other rest of the world. So it is really hard for young people, entrepreneurs, to start digital uh, enterprises or digital companies. For example, we still don't have credit cards or we don't have any online shopping. So and with the help of letting internet access or internet accessibility in Iraq, that would be way better for the young people to start their own businesses and to be able to access the other world because it is completely disconnected and whenever I try to buy something or anything, Iraq is ex excluded. Either we cannot do shipping or buying anything or even the page will not be loaded or it will not be shown for the Iraqi uh, people. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alejandra and I'm from Mexico. I have a lot of ideas now, but I, I think I, I know I have to be fast with this. I think that it's cool that we are making a lot of enterprises and building uh, technologies that are awesome. Yeah, I think that's okay. But we also need to focus on the people that we are selling them. I think that we need to focus also on the kind of people that we are talking to because maybe they are poor, maybe they are not, not only in my country, all over the world. I think that the aim of this event is to get to know everyone that we need to, to see that there is more over the world. So for the enterprises of technology, for example, when there are poor people, we need to get to know them, give them information, give them a lot of information that can help to have, I don't know, to, that make them build more technology and also because they are brilliant. There are a lot of brilliant people and I think that's the aim of this event, to get to know all the people all over the world that they can do it and they can build a lot of enterprises and, of, uh, and a lot of technology that can help the world. I think that we can change them because we are the future. Thank you. Sorry, I speak Spanish. Bueno, este, mi, to, eh, yo vengo de Nicaragua. Yeah, I'm from Nicaragua. Mi idea es que las Naciones Unidas no solo deberían de reunirse en un evento, un como hoy lo están haciendo, que es una oportunidad para nosotros que promuevan nuestra idea, sino que ya sea anualmente distribuyan fondos para que cada país este, les permita a sus estudiantes, a sus jóvenes desarrollar sus ideas y promover una idea por cada país para promover nuestro futuro. ¿Por qué? Porque todas las cosas que hoy tenemos nosotros procedieron o vinieron de un pasado que en ese momento tan solo fueron sueños o ideas de alguien, pero que hoy se volvieron realidad. Y entonces, de este modo, podemos hacer realidad los sueños de muchas personas en el mundo. So uh, I'm going to present myself first really quickly. My name is Robel and I'm from France. And uh, I think this conference, we all know, is about empowering the youth. Um, we know that children really don't have an opportunity to talk to um, people who have authoritative roles in uh, the government, for example. And I think that what we need to do is give them a pathway um, to communicate their ideas because kids, they're young, they're imaginative, and they have sometimes really great ideas which we um, sometimes when we grow older, we uh, seem to no longer have the capacity to well, brainstorm, I guess. So um, my idea is to give children and, uh, well not children, but uh, um, growing adults, uh, especially people who are in university um, studying languages and, and law and all that stuff, to give them um, a pathway to communicating with people who have authoritative roles in our society. Thank you. Hello, uh, Claude again from Rwanda, Caleb. Uh, my idea is about education. Uh, I strongly believe in education as a tool that can change societies. So my suggestion to uh, ITU and the UN is to really invest in education, but not any kind of education, but education that empower young people and allows them to have critical thinking, thus uh, come up with innovations that solve real problems. Thank you. My name is Sharon, I'm from Kenya. Um, uh, hello, 
My name is Sharon. I'm from Kenya. I'm a fifth year telecommunication and information engineering student. I'm also with telecenter.org. My message to the UN and to the ITU is regarding telecenters. Um, I believe that um, the UN should encourage the growth of more telecenters, where, especially in rural areas, where we can have young people coming together and sharing their ideas on a continual basis, not necessarily just during summits like this, and whereby they can also get access like, to the internet and where they can also get access to computers, because you find that um, people in rural communities don't necessarily have the same opportunities that we have. So my message is that in development of, in development of ideas, let us not leave the, um, those in rural communities behind. Let us develop telecenters where they can also share their ideas and join us in this great cause. Thank you. Hello, my name is Pupa Hano from Botswana. I am thankful for this opportunity that the UN has created for us. And in order for this not to be a one-time thing, I am proposing to the UN that they, they make it a point that the youth is included in the UN General Assembly meetings that they usually hold. So for them to have a youth represent, representative in the meetings. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Esto, yo soy Carlos Aramillo de Panamá. Esto, primero que todo, felicidad. First of all, thank you for the initiative that uh, all the youth that we have access to issues that we get to speak to decision makers. I have two topics here. First of all, as from Panama, how, in Panama, how are we going to do the radio electric spectrum when there is no more room for other technologies for example we have led that has been implemented so far in panama but what happens when the um, bandwidth runs out how are we going to implement that? how are we going to expand that different uh, methods of compression of uh, signals so we need to address that issue prices uh the cost benefit relation in equipment there is uh, this issue, the financial issue, when it comes to farmers, the, um, the prices of demand versus the cost of supply for maintenance of their land via GPS. When do I have, for example, uh, satellite images that will help me know when I need to put some uh, uh, fertilizers in my hand? If I present that to uh, coffee, producers are going to tell me that's too expensive so there really is no uh, cost benefit relation that is positive the, we cannot use that technology in order to make the most out of their businesses that's just one of the issues good afternoon i am rose Emmanuel from nigeria what i want the u.n and the itu to do is that i want them to set up in cyber security emergency team but they will set this cyber security emergency team in every country in the whole world not only in, in the whole world they're going to make section zonal centers these zonal centers we cover sensitization that will implement them into schooling in this asset in this instance they were able to transfer information to the young ones the young ones will be, be sensitized they know the rules on how to go about through the internet. Thank you very much. My name is Scarlett. I'm from Nicaragua. I am an engineer in renewable energies. My proposal is that the youth that are probably more creative uh, when it comes to, uh, to different uses or different sources of energy other than oil because we are not going to deplete our natural resources and we need to start producing clean energy and through ITCs we can definitely share information, share ideas on how we can actually create synergies to start implementing the rollout of cleaner energies because we are creative and at some point this is going to become a reality.
Good evening. My name is Diego Alvarez. I'm from Costa Rica. My question for the UN is probably just the rural areas of my country. These are the most impacted areas around the globe. This is where we can probably provide more leverage, where people can be educated from scratch. And uh, this is usually those that are ignored the most. But if we do implement the necessary tools, there is a tremendous potential in all of these areas, kids that are incredibly creative and that uh, could become uh, very, very profitable in this area. Uh, we could start working with the betterment, technological betterment of all these rural areas in remote areas of the country. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lenan. I'm from Honduras. Well, in the UN, I want to say, as um, my partner said, we have to focus on the more of the poorer countries. I have known people who do not have the means to come forward, and ITCs are important means to do so. Uh, there are people who are ignorant, but not because they want to, but because they haven't had the opportunity. There are intelligent people that are basically uneducated, but that can be changed, and we are wasting all of that human talent. Education is the key. There is so many possibilities. There are so many advantages with people who are simply dormant talent. That would be a good solution to start off by facilitating for all of these people the necessary ITCs. And technology changes constantly, so we should also keep the updates on mind, not only just providing a computer coming back 20 years after, because that changes constantly and we must update all of this equipment. So that is something that is going to aid a lot and provide a lot of help in the world because uh, that will bring out the best in people. Thank you. Excuse me, I speak French. Being, I come from Senegal. I'm an entrepreneur in Senegal. I uh, developed applications, and we have social applications, particularly for syndicates. What I propose for the UN is to support syndicates. And that's the objective. Our objective is to develop applications that will allow us allow us to help the syndicates to contribute for the development of our countries. We are developers, and uh, we must aim our needs. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Neil Vargas. I'm from Nicaragua. So when we talk about education and when we talk about rural areas, I believe it's important to use ITC so that business owners that actually empirically generate uh, profit, that uh, it'd be good to actually create an open channel of communication as to, for example, create accounting systems because most of these people who are empirical farmers they don't have that type of built-in skill. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, you guys were awesome. Um, if I can be helpful with the first steps in any of your businesses, please let me know how. I'll do whatever I can. Um, the best way to reach me, my Twitter is Rob Fitz, R-O-B-F-I-T-Z. Uh, I respond to that much more than email. <laughs> so that's how you can get me. Um, and give yourselves a huge round of applause. Great work today. And I hope you start where you want to start. 
Uh, and now we've got about five minutes, and then the next session is just in this room, so you guys don't have terribly far to go. <laughs> Yeah. 